Hello, and welcome to the conversation with author Peter Ho Davies. My name is Naomi Sig, and I'm the director of the Office of Multicultural Affairs. We are so thankful that you've uh, chosen to join us today for this wonderful event. Um, this event would not have been possible without the generous sponsorship of the Office of Multicultural Affairs, the Undergraduate Diversity Collaborative, and the Annisfield Wolf. Uh, book award fellows at Case Western Reserve University. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderators so that we can get the program started. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Lisa Nielsen, and I am one of the two Annis Field Wolf's fellows for our program called Sages, and it's a delight to be here. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Clara Hahn, and I'm a sophomore undergraduate at Case. I actually learned about Peter Ho Davies' books taking one of Lisa's classes in my first semester of freshman year, and I'm just so excited to be here today. Naomi, would you want me to introduce Peter now? Peter Ho Davies is the author of five works of fiction, including the novels A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself, The Fortunes, a New York Times notable book winner, winner of the Annisfield Wolf Award, and the Chats of Chautauqua Prize and a finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and The Welsh Girl, long listed for the Man Booker Prize and a London Times bestseller. He also has published two short story collections, The Ugliest House in the World, winner of the John Lewin Reese Prize and the Oregon Book Award and Equal Love, finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and a New York Times notable book. His work has appeared in Harper's, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, The Guardian, The New York Times, Washington Post, and TLS, among others, and has been widely anthologized, including selections for prize stories, the O. Henry Awards 1998, and Best American Short Stories 1995, 1996, and 2000. In 2003, Granter Magazine named him among its best of young British novelists. Davies is also a recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for Arts and is a winner of the Penn Malamud and Penn Macmillan Awards. Davies has taught at the University of Oregon, Emory University, Northwestern University, and for the last 20 years in the Helen Zell MFA program in creative writing at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he is the Charles Baxter Distinguished Collegiate Professor. Thank you so much, Claire. That was a lovely introduction. I really appreciate that. And thank you to Lisa and Naomi for making this happen as well. And thanks to everybody out there as well. I'm uh, glad to be uh, joining you all today. Um, gosh, Claire, you're making me feel old, right? I've been teaching in Ann Arbor for 20 years. Um, I, I, actually, in a way, it's good. I was, um, when you mentioned that best of young British novelists thing that Granta listed me under, in 2003 or 2004, I always feel a little embarrassed because obviously not so young anymore, it was a long time ago. But actually in the context of our conversation today, um, that's a nice reference. It's always, I think, good for me when I'm talking to audiences for them to know that I have a British background. So they, they place the accent quickly. I think I gave a reading years ago and um, somebody said to me, um, I don't think it was mentioned where I was from, but they asked me after the reading, you know, uh, where I was from. And I explained I was from Britain. And they said, I noticed you had an accent, but I thought it might just be an affectation. So I always like to clear that up from the get go. Um, that was also oddly, it, it reminds me the best of young British novelists thing, I think is, um, is reminding me of it as well. When I was a much younger writer in my teens, when Granta first did that list, they do it every 10 years or so, um, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro was on that list. Um, and, and I think for a young British person of Asian background in my teens, um, what was actually most significant of seeing him on that list was seeing somebody who looked like me being listed as British. Uh, and so that felt um, timely in this particular moment that we're, we're having this conversation about. I should say, oddly enough, um, possibly at that same reading where somebody wasn't sure about my accent, um, I think that person maybe came up to me after the reading and they put two and two together and they saw an Asian face and they heard a British accent and they thought he's reading fiction. And I think they thought I was Kazuo Ishiguro. And it was very flattering, I should say, because I'm a huge fan of Ishiguro's work and he's been important to me uh, as a writer. Um, but I also felt a, a moment of terrible embarrassment and disappointment that I wasn't Kazuo Ishiguro. I felt like I was gonna have to break it to this guy, um, which I did, I was honest about the whole thing. And I think I was at least as disappointed as, as the person was that I wasn't Ishiguro. But I, I should say, I told this story um, once 
Um, more recently, when I met Ishiguru for the one and only time, he came and gave a reading in Ann Arbor. He was charming and lovely. Um, and you know, I felt, I suppose, a kind of pride of being mistaken for him. But he completely won up to me by pointing out that he had um, once been mistaken for Jackie Chan, I think, at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, and that seemed an even cooler person to be mistaken for, possibly in some ways as well. And all of this by way of um, introduction to what I'm going to read today. I think, um, as those examples suggest, um, uh, it is easy for people to uh, sometimes confuse or mistake uh, people of various Asian backgrounds and ancestries. And as those examples suggest, sometimes it's uh, amusing or comic or makes a good anecdote. Um, I'm sadly going to read a portion of my novel, The Fortunes, um, which uh, is a much more tragic example of mistaken identity in this regard as well. It concerns um, the hate crime murder of uh, Vincent Chin in Detroit in 1982, so sort of close to to um, where I live in Ann Arbor. Um, and I think I'm just gonna launch into this. The section of the book is um, fairly self-contained. I won't read the whole of it, but I'll read um, a section that will hopefully um, draw back the circumstances of that case for folks along the way. Uh, I should say, uh, maybe by way of, is this a trigger warning? Maybe. Um, not just that there will be some violence, of course, uh, inevitably in this grim story. Um, but there will also be some off-color jokes, some, uh, well, actually the word would be racist jokes. Um, they're told by my narrator, who's Asian American, and I'd like to think of them as, um, as him reclaiming the jokes, that they are being told in ways that rebound upon their original tellers. So I hope them to be um, a little bit empowering in certain ways as well. Um, I sometimes like to say that in an auditorium, in case people want to laugh, it's a little harder to know if people are doing that on Zoom. Um, but if you do, I think it's okay, because this narrator in telling them, I think, is at least trying to elicit a kind of um, a laugh at the perpetrators of such jokes. Okay, so. Um, Without further ado, let me uh, call this up. Um, and so this section of the book is called Tell It Slant. Soon it'll be three decades. A ceremony is planned, a memorial, a plaque to be unveiled. It's more than a year away yet, but already I have an invitation to attend, to say a few words, to share my recollections. It lies on my desk. Never forget, it says, always remember keep his memory alive. At the bottom, in smaller font, it also says, save the day. A typo, though I must have read it three times before I even noticed. Now it's all I can think of, that malapropism. Maybe it's why I've not written back yet to decline as I've declined all such invitations for years. It's a mistake my father might easily have made anyone of his immigrant generation. I wonder if the letter writer is older or more likely someone still hearing an elder's voice in his head. So what do I remember? What does anyone remember after all this time? If you remember it at all, if you're around in the 80s, say, what you remember is a Chinese guy being beaten to death in Detroit by two white auto workers who mistook him for a Japanese. This at the height of the import scare when Japanese manufacturers were being blamed for the collapse of the big three U.S. auto companies. Maybe you remember it happened outside a club where the Chinese guy, actually a Chinese American named Vincent Chin, was celebrating his bachelor party. Maybe you remember he was buried on what should have been his wedding day. But perhaps you thought it was just an urban legend, a bad joke come to life. A Chinaman and a Jew walk into a bar, order drinks, they get to chatting, then out of nowhere the Jew turns around and sucker punches the Chinaman in the face. What the hell was that for, splutters the Chinaman, and the Jew goes, Pearl Harbor. But that was the Japanese. I'm Chinese. Oi, sorry. You've all got that black hair and slanty eyes. It was an honest mistake. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Well, all right then, the Chinaman says, and they shake and order another round. But ten, to me, ten minutes later, the Chinaman rears back and cold cocks the Jew. What the hell was that for, the Jew asks, picking himself up. The Titanic, the Chinaman says. The Titanic, the Jew cries, the Titanic, that was a goddamn iceberg. Iceberg, Goldberg, Steinberg, the Jew Chinaman says, honest mistake. Only that night, it wasn't a Chinaman and a Jew. It was two Chinamen, Vincent and me. And it wasn't a bar, but a strip club. And we were with a couple of white friends, Bill and Jerry, but still. I don't know about an honest mistake, but it was an easy one. 
It was dark in there, filmed with smoke, lit only by the snowy static of glitter balls. One of the girls used a fog machine in her routine, another flickered in a strobe. I'm not sure I could have told Chinese from Japanese in that light, but I knew the pair, one silvering, the other mustachioed across the stage, were white, and they knew we weren't. He wasn't a saint, Vincent, though we always figured he might have been named for one. The newspapers all reported he was there for his bachelor party, and sure, that was the occasion. But bachelor party makes it sound like a one-off, like we took him there when it was his idea, and a regular haunt of his, his turf, the fancy pants lounge in Highland Park. The girls all knew him. He was a favorite. Contrary to the stereotype, which is why I say it, he wasn't a eunuch. The only thing that was different about him that night then, it was supposed to be his last time. He told me his mother had given him the ultimatum. She knew about the club, his mom, but not his fiancée, Vicky. For her, it was almost as shocking as his death. He promised he'd quit going after he married. It's the last time, Ma. I remember because he said she didn't like that, him saying last time. She was superstitious that way, said it was bad luck. Can't win is what he shouted over the music, his breath warm in my ear. Me, I didn't believe him anyway, figured he'd be back the week after the honeymoon. Maybe I even hoped so secretly. It was the first time he'd asked me since I moved home after college, my first time ever in a strip club. I dressed preppy, pastel polo over khakis and topsiders. Jerry in his mullet and acid wash jeans laughed when I got in the car. It's not a disco, man. The girls dance for you, not with you. Ah, lay off him. I was working towards my CPA back then. Vincent had come straight from the restaurant, still in his black slacks and white shirt, but he'd slipped on his members-only jacket. He was riding shotgun, and from the back seat, I watched him spread the wings of his collar and the visor mirror to reveal a thin gold chain. The papers also said what a filial son he was, working two jobs, draftsman by day, waiter by night, to support his poor widowed mother, as well as save for his wedding. They made him out to be a model citizen of the model minority, Saint Anne stereotype. But think, that night he must have had 50 bucks and smoothed out singles on him. Chips, baby. So what exactly was he working so hard for? Two jobs to pay for two lives, maybe. So no saint. Our generation is Bruce Lee, someone once called him, meaning our generation is tragic martyr. Such an American concept. See Lincoln, Abe, Kennedy's assorted, Dr. King, not to mention James Dean, Marilyn Monroe. But Bruce Lee, for all that he was born in the US, always felt more Chinese than Chinese American, and at least as popular with whites and blacks. Plus his death, an allergic reaction to medication, lacked a bad guy. One reason rumors of triad plots or drug abuse, shades of those old Chinatown evils abounded. But now we had our own martyr. I always wondered how I was supposed to feel about that. I was the friend after all. Could I have saved him? Should I have died with him? But then he wouldn't be a martyr, or perhaps we both would be, though martyrs, like most symbols, come best in ones. Instead, I was the witness. In all the newspaper accounts, and now online if you care to look it up, his friend who ran away, if you can be a friend and run away. Without Bruce Lee, though, would two white men have brought a baseball bat to a fight with an Asian? Had they seen his movies? Did they think they were only being smart, evening the odds against some kung fu fighter? Vincent did look a little like Bruce, that same thick mop of coal black hair. So did I, for that matter. We didn't look alike, but we looked like Bruce, more like him than each other, probably. We'd spent our teens practicing his sprung stride and sudden panting punches, flashing his switchblade smile in the mirror. A horse walks into a bar. You know this one? And the bartender asks, why the long face? Yeah? Well, how about this one? Two Chinamen walk into a bar and the barkeep goes, why the same face? Okay. But we weren't the same. That's my point. That's what got him killed. On the one hand, he was more Chinese than me and most of the other Chinese-American kids I knew. He was born there, lived there until he was six before he was adopted, itself pretty rare back then, didn't even speak English in first grade. Then again, his parents didn't live in or around Chinatown like most of ours. They were in Highland Park with no Chinese neighbors. Oh, they came to Chinatown to do their shopping every weekend. I'd see him around, knew who he was, but Highland Park was where he lived, where he went to school, with white kids. Poles, 
Irish, Italian. This was before the riots, white flight. So he was always more at ease with them, more at ease with them than we were for sure, but also maybe more at ease with them than with us. That's where he met Bill and Jerry in grade school. I only knew him well in high school. They always had that first claim on him. It's one reason Vincent liked the fancy pants, even though it was a rat hole, an old grind house with rows of movie seats still in back and the girls up on stage beneath the peeling gilt proscenium. It meant he got to go back to Highland Park, back home. He'd always hated having to leave, driven out as he saw it. His dad had been mugged, so they'd moved to the suburbs and Vincent had finished high school there. They traded a third floor walk up for a nice little ranch with a carport and scalloped aluminium awnings two blocks over from ours. My father talked about Oak Park like it was the promised land, but it never sat right with Vincent. Can't sleep right, he complained. He missed the shush of traffic at night. Really, it felt like running away, I think. He didn't blame his dad. Mr. Chin was an older guy in his 60s by then, but Vincent always figured he'd have fought back if it were him. You could say he'd been spoiling for that fight for years. The irony is, he was a great runner. That was his thing in high school, track. I was a heavy kid, shy in the cafeteria, so I'd take my lunch on the bleachers, watch him doing his laps. I told him running suited his name, and he looked at me blankly. Vincent, I said, it means winner. He liked that, as I hoped he would, but it surprised me he hadn't known. Then again, he went by Vince at school, at least, itself unusual among us. Our boys' names, even in English, often echoing the two syllables of a Chinese name, Roland or Robin, Henry or Melvin, Eddie or Albert. Myself, I used to call him Invince because he was invincible. I told him, but also because he was in, in a way I never could be. Really, I knew Vince just meant American. On the wedding invitation, it was Vincent in embossed italics. Vincent and Victoria, both winners, Vicky and Vince. As a couple, they couldn't have sounded more all-American. They were planning two ceremonies. Vicky had two dresses picked out, one Chinese, one Western. When I asked him that night how the planning was going, he told me his mother was arguing with Vicky over guests throwing rice. She says Chinese don't waste food, still remembers going hungry during the war. The wedding was planned for a Monday when all the Chinese restaurants were closed so that everyone could attend. Afterwards, they had tickets for Aruba. His middle name was Jen, though I only learned it when he died. He never used it and it shows only as a J on his gravestone. I had to ask what it stood for. Jen, the great Confucian virtue of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. What do I remember? What do you? If you remember the case at all, if you're Asian American, say, you might recall the killers, Evans and Pitts, father and stepson, pled manslaughter. It was just a barroom brawl gone wrong, heat of the moment stuff, an honest mistake. Never mind, it took them 30 minutes to hunt Vincent down. The victim had thrown the first punch after all. They got off with probation and fines of $3,000 each. Less than the price of a used car, people said. Maybe you remember that the judge had been a POW in a Japanese camp during the war. Remember when Chinese couldn't testify against whites, people said, as if it were yesterday and not a hundred years ago. It was Vincent's idea. He told me to run, only he didn't say run, he said scram. It was the last word I heard from him in English, so I've given it a lot of thought. Scram. It's what you say to a kid, isn't it? A nuisance. Or maybe what naughty kids say to each other after they ring a doorbell. Scram. Not run. He was a runner. Running to him meant winning, running towards something. Scram, I think, meant running away. If he'd said run, we might have both run. But scram, that was for me. Because he didn't scram. He waited for them. He could have gotten away when Evans hopped out of the car at Plymouth for the record. It was still moving. It ran over his foot, for God's sake. It was the Keystone clan out there. You think Vincent couldn't have outrun these guys? He let it in track. But he was done running. He'd started it at the club, after all. He would have fought them in the gravel and dog shit parking lot outside, too, if Evans hadn't gone for the bat. He wanted to fight them. Maybe he thought he could make Evans drop the bat, shame him into a fair fight. Maybe he figured just two on one, they wouldn't feel they needed the bat. This was on Woodward by the McDonald's there. I didn't run far, to the edge of the light, just far enough to live, just far enough to watch. Scram. Who was he to tell me to scram?
Who was I to listen? He was grappling with Pitts when Evans caught him on the knees as if reaching for a grounder, after which Vincent couldn't have run even if he'd wanted. Then a lion drive to the chest as he went down, two more to the head when he was on all fours, swinging for the fences. I did run back, but too late. Vincent's last words, it's not fair, to me in Chinese while I cradled his ruined head, blood bubbling from his mouth and nose as he spoke, blood pouring from his ears like oil. His skull felt like rotten fruit. The blow to the chest broke a jade charm Vincent wore on his chain, a bad omen to Chinese, so you hardly needed an omen to foretell what was coming next. The ambulance took him to Henry Ford Hospital, same hospital he used to take his dad for dialysis, where he lingered for a few days, his mother by his bedside calling him, Vincent, mama coming, Vincent, as if from a great distance before she finally gave consent to turn him off. The same hospital where they told her 30 years earlier that she'd never have a child. If you remember the case at all, and maybe it's coming back to you, if you were watching TV back then, you might recall her, Vincent's mother, Lily, going on Donahue, remember him? Or meeting with Jesse Jackson, remember him? At one of his presidential campaign rallies. She put the yellow in the rainbow coalition, people said. She still had one of those comedy chinglish accents. What I live for, I don't have happy anymore, I not care my life. The kind of accent that makes my generation cringe. Vincent used to do a choice imitation of it. But her voice cracked, daring anyone to laugh, daring anyone to feel embarrassed belly hurt my heart. Lily. But Mrs. Chin to me always, just another mom, but stouter, shriller, fiercer and more doting than all the rest, that she seemed somehow like everyone's mother, everyone else's. Mine had died of ovarian cancer before I turned seven. When we were kids, she always had treats, egg tarts, mooncakes in fall, her homemade prawn crackers, and she praised my appetite. When we grew up, she was always asking when I was going to get married, telling Vincent to introduce me to some nice girl, to which he would roll his eyes, so whether for my benefit or hers, I was never quite sure. All I learned about her life came from the newspapers. Some of it I doubt even Vincent knew. She'd grown up in Canton, her family owned a department store, they must have been well off, but they lost it all in the war. She'd come from China in 47 to marry his dad, who'd lived here since the 20s, and earned his citizenship by enlisting. Mrs. Chin's own father had resisted the match. An ancestor had worked on the railroads and had been driven out, but she was sure it would be a better life. She'd seen so much violence in China at the hands of the Japanese, she wanted to start over. She'd have been 27, old to marry, delayed by the war, and Vincent's dad even older at 44. I guess they tried to start a family of their own, but she miscarried and the docs told her she couldn't have kids. It took them more than a decade to adopt Vincent from Hong Kong. His father was in his late 50s by then, and even Lily in her 40s, the oldest parents of anyone I knew. They worked their whole lives in laundries and restaurants. For what? Vincent asked me savagely during his father's final illness. They never had any fun. We were outside in his driveway, smoking. Mrs. Chin framed in the kitchen window, intently washing rice as if panning for gold. I knew what it was to lose a parent. I'd come to pay my respects. I didn't know his father well. What I remember most is his sure-handed ability to pluck out a fish's eyeball with his chopsticks, a deafness which impressed me as a child almost as much as his relish in eating it appalled me. But I knew the answer to Vincent's question. For what? For you. It was the same for all of us kids, the debt he could never redeem, no matter how late he sat up rubbing the old man's swollen knuckles when he couldn't sleep. First his dad, now Vincent himself. Part of what was so moving was that his mother's desire for justice, her thirst for vengeance, they were ways of forgiving his most unfilial act, dying before her, besides which sneaking off to strip clubs under Vicky's nose was a pale betrayal. And it happened when I finally got home from the hospital and told my father everything. He pulled me close and hugged him. I couldn't remember the last time we'd touched. I had failed my friend, I understood, but been a good son. They called themselves the ACJ, American Citizens for Justice, no mention of Chinese or Asian in the name, and insisted that placards at marches be in English, which may explain the painful, plaintive pun of 
chin up for justice on one popular sign. So they're the ones, journalists, lawyers, church leaders, local businessmen, who helped Lily to get the case reopened. And they're coming together, Chinese and Japanese, those old enemies, as well as Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, mark the start of a pan-Asian political movement. And me, along with the rest, attending meetings, giving interviews, marching beneath a neatly lettered sign. You could say it's when we became Asian American. Two drunk white guys couldn't tell us apart, and we realized we were more alike than we thought. The first meetings were held in the Golden Star, the restaurant where Vincent worked, everyone sitting around the fresh laid tables, plastic tablecloths and melamine rice balls, trying not to disturb the settings, looking less angry or sad in that context than hungry. It reminded me of his funeral the previous summer, and these weren't all the same people who'd come then. I don't, didn't know many of them, many of them didn't know Vincent, and they spoke of that night as if they'd been there, as if they'd been attacked. And in a way, I guess they felt they had, if not by Evans, then by the verdict. Part of me wanted to say something. Didn't they know who I was? But then it came to me that all their talk of a heinous assault, a brutal slaying, wasn't the way you talk about it if you were there. That wasn't how I remembered it. It was how they imagined it. They weren't talking as if they'd been there, but as if they wished they had been. What would they have done if they had, I wondered, and I held my peace. It reminded me of Vincent, the way he told me about his father's mugging. They were spoiling for a fight too. Back in the kitchen, I remember, the cooks were preparing dishes for later, the hot oil singing in the steel walks. I didn't say anything in the end, but Lily was there and she spoke last, halting but firm. She wanted justice for Vincent and we applauded until our hands stung. But a lot of the people in that room also wanted justice for themselves. Me too, I suppose. I had failed my friend, but maybe there was still something I could do. Don't make a federal case out of it. Wasn't that the Chinese-American way? Turn the other cheek, look the other way, water off a Peking duck's back. Take it on the chin as a sick joke doing the rounds had it. But making a federal case is literally what we did, what we had to do to get the case reopened and prosecuted by the Justice Department as a hate crime. Only it had never been done before. Civil rights legislation hadn't been applied to Asians previously. Doing so now is a hot topic, a choice. Whose lot to throw in with? Blacks for whom the legislation had been written, some of whom were suspicious of a possible usurpation or dilution as if Asian struggles were equivalent, or whites who many of us aspired to be like. I sat at the back of those meetings, between the payphone and the cigarette machine. Every so often the talk would be interrupted, hushed really, by someone trying to come in to eat, the irritated exchanges at the door when they were turned away. I couldn't see from where I was, but I imagined they were probably white. It was that kind of a restaurant, the kind where white diners point out the few Chinese to each other and whisper how the food must be authentic. I wondered what they thought if they glimpsed a crowd of Chinese inside before the door shut on them. And as to our question, were we a minority or were we honorary members of the majority? I reckon I know what Vincent would have chosen, Vince. But to get justice for him, we chose the other. Later, I heard some black scholars, freedom riders. So a federal case, and I was called to testify, to say what I'd heard, what I'd seen, what I'd done, what I remembered. It was a race thing, no doubt. One of the strippers, Lacey, remembered the line, and then we all did. It's because if you little motherfuckers were out of work, Evans said, meaning Japanese, even though he wasn't out of work himself, even though Vincent wasn't Japanese. But okay, the car business wasn't a crapper, as Vincent very well knew. He was working for an auto supplier, after all. He was in the business. Would it have made a difference if Vincent had said, I'm Chinese? That his mother had moved to the US because she couldn't live in China after the war with her memories of the Japanese bombing? Probably not. Nips, chinks, gooks, slants, we were all the same to them. Instead, he said, I'm not a little motherfucker. And Evans came back with drunken magnanimity. Big fucker, little fucker, we're all fuckers. And then Vincent stubbed out his cigarette and went for him. Punches were thrown, a stool. Pitts had his head cut open. I'm not a motherfucker, he said, and he wasn't. But it's the word that set him off, I think, more than the race thing even, that we heard every day anyhow. 
but he didn't like motherfucker. He was an adoptee. His father had died less than a year earlier. He still lived at home and he was about to get married. He didn't like that word. It's unfilial, okay? Disrespectful. We worship our ancestors. I wonder sometimes about the odd echoes. An adoptee and his mother, a father and a stepson, perhaps they all had something to prove. Evans did say, I was just defending my boy. He was a superintendent at Chrysler when Pitts had been laid off. Maybe he felt he owed him. Maybe he loved him like his own. They still played baseball together, is why they had the back bat in the trunk in the first place. Turns out Evans only took Pitts to the club that night because the boy had just had a fight with his girlfriend. And the day after, the only day either of them ever woke up in a cell, Father's Day. Vincent was my friend, so how could I leave him? He was my friend, but I didn't always like him. How could I not envy his confidence, his good looks, his fiance? Even afterwards, I hated him a little. Even in death, he made me feel like nothing, worse than nothing, a coward. Though it wasn't right, those two getting off for killing him. But that's not why I testified. I wanted to stand up, even if belatedly. I felt like the guilty party. So I met with Tina, the young Chinese lawyer, and Jerry and Bill around a cigarette burned table. And she told us, you need to get your lines down. Agree on what happened. Get your stories straight. Tina was slim and a little severe, but her long hair shone like Vicky's. Vincent would have called her fine, found a way to make her smile. That's when we remembered the racist talk, heard by all of us above the throbbing music, clearly recalled despite all the booze we'd drunk. And Vincent's last words, heard only by me, spoken in Chinese so no one else could understand, never mind that his head was already stove in, jaws shattered, and people wondered how he could have even retained consciousness, let alone spoken. Well, okay, but it wasn't fair, was it? None of it. You tell me that's not true. So what did I do? What would you have done? Evan's got 25 years. Out the courtroom window, I watched a jet slowly raise a scar across the sky. What is truth anyway? What I testified, this version, what you can read in the papers or online, Chinese whispers, you might say. Vincent, incidentally, wanted to be a lawyer when he was a kid. His mother told him no one would believe a Chinese lawyer. He wanted to be a writer, too, but she told him he'd never make any money at it. By the time I knew him, he was thinking about being a vet, but she reminded him he was scared of blood. He was my friend, but did I like him or was I just like him? Maybe, just maybe, if you remember the case at all, if you saw the Oscar-nominated documentary or studied it in a school or read a blog about it, you'll recall that Evans's federal conviction was later appealed. Lacey's testimony was called into doubt. Had she received consideration for other charges? And the witness's testimony, our testimony, our memory, by this time five years had passed since that night, was challenged. We'd been coached by our Chinese lawyer, they said. What did I remember? When did I remember it? I don't know. The air conditioning was blasting in court, but my shirt was sticking to me like a Band-Aid. What if I didn't want to remember that night? Did anyone think of that? Maybe you remember the conviction was overturned on appeal. Afterwards, I couldn't bear to face her, Lily, Mrs. Chin, and she couldn't bear to stay in the US. She already had her ticket back to China when the first verdict came out, but it only delayed things. She finally went back 40 years after she left, went home, some might say, to Canton, though by then it was called Guangzhou. She used to say she couldn't remain in a land of injustice, but I always thought it was the vicious ironies that drove her out. She'd left China after all to escape her memories of the Japanese invasion, only to have her son killed because he was mistaken for a Japanese and then to make common cause with Japanese Americans in her search for justice. Toyota, Datsun, Honda, Pearl Harbor went a popular Detroit bumper sticker back in the day. Ten years after Vincent's death, Lee Iacocca, Chrysler's president and pitchman, was still complaining that the Japanese were, quote, beating our brains in. Recently, I read Buick was a bestseller in China. I wonder how Mrs. Chin might have felt seeing American cars on the roads there. She lived in China another 20 years, but came back to the U.S. for cancer treatment at the end of her life. The Asian American Rosa Parks, the obits called her. She's buried between Vincent and his father. They asked me to her funeral too, as they've asked me faithfully to anniversaries and conferences and rallies down the year, as they've asked me to this latest memorial. I appreciate the sentiment. 
they forgive me for lying or not lying well enough either way if only I could forgive myself but it's too late for the truth now you can't say all this stuff at an unveiling in a documentary or an interview you can't say all this when someone calls you a motherfucker I RSVP'd my regrets this morning I can't and never could save the day Lily used to say Vincent still be live if I hadn't adopted him I should have talked to her we were the two who felt most guilty, the ones who most wanted someone else to pay. This afternoon, at least, I went to her grave, all their graves, cleaned the stones, left oranges and lit joss. The sod over Vincent and his father is a shade greener than that over his mother's more recent plot, like jade that darkens from wearing. There's a canton near Detroit, as it happens, pronounced Canton, which is why I didn't think about it for years. You pass signs for it on the way to the cemetery. A little research tells me there used to be a local Peking and a Nankin too, all named in the 1830s, when the nation was fascinated by all things Chinese before any Chinese had arrived. There were cantons all across the country, dating from the same period in Ohio, Mississippi, Georgia, Kansas, Texas. The canton in South Dakota was said to be on the exact other side from its namesake. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much, Peter, for, for reading that uh, part of your book, in The Fortunes. We very much appreciate it. And, and, you know, as you were reading, I was thinking about um, even today, as we listen to the tragic, tragic murder of, of Vincent Chin, we can probably recount off the top even of our, our minds um, dozens of, of incidents of, of anti-Asian violence and hate that have kind of been a surge in the United States over the past year and a half. And so, um, you know, something that I, I would love to, to hear from you is, you know, how have you been managing, what have been your reflections on uh, this portion of your book and that part of history and how it's sort of coming, coming kind of to fruition right now in today's society? Yeah, it's shocking. I think it says at the start of that section, the novel, when the, the character, um, the friend of Vincent's who's with him on that night, uh, he talks about it being 30 years. And of course, in fact, um, uh, partly because the novel came out about five years ago, um, it's actually now coming around uh, as we think about um, uh, next June of 2022, it'll be 40 years since that. So it's really shocking um, that it feels on the one hand like a long time ago. It's a sort of a period piece when you write into that space, and yet it feels incredibly shockingly, horrifically fresh, I think in various ways. Um, I mean, there are a lot of parallels that we might think into in that space. I suppose we, um, we imagine right now, of course, that um, the rise in this anti-Asian sentiment that has resulted in so many attacks and so much violence and so much uh, anxiety amongst the community um, feels like it's very much tied to the pandemic. Of course, we get to hear those terrible ideas of, you know, the, the Kung flu. I always think of that as a teaching moment where I might say it's spelled Kung F-U actually, is the way I like to tell people when they bring that up. Um, but I've had, I, I think it actually goes back deeper than that, I think, and is connected, I think, to some of the, the same provocations that resulted in the violence around Vincent's uh, attack. Um, and those go back to economic anxieties. Um, you know, so even prior to um, uh, the virus, there was a lot of anti-Chinese rhetoric that was emerging um, from the Trump uh, uh, regime. Um, I can remember, in fact, as I was writing the book for a little while, there was, in fact, um, an epigraph at the start of that section of the book from um, then candidate Trump from a speech he gave in Vegas in 2012, uh, where in fact he called the Chinese motherfuckers and that language, the echo of that, of course, that, that word crops up and is an inciting word in the, uh, the violence that uh, leads to Vincent's death, um, felt like a strange callback. Um, and oddly in 2015 or 2016, when I was finishing up that book before the election, my editor and I were talking about that epigraph and thinking, well, it seems very timely right now um, but hopefully it'll feel very dated if the election isn't won by candidate Trump. Um, you know, I'm not too sorry to not have quotes from Donald Trump in my book at this point, um, but it does feel as though um, 
there was an awful kind of prescience to that that echo and that moment. Um, but it does feel like, as it was in the 80s when there was this anxiety about Japanese imports in the car industry, uh, as it was in 2012 when Trump made those comments about Chinese uh, taxing and tariffs and the like, um, that the upsurge, even though it's been sparked, I think, by the virus, is very much about an economic anxiety. It's the anxiety of a global economic superpower beginning to fear for its international um, sway, I suspect. Um, so it comes out of, I guess what I'm going to say is that while we as a community are made very anxious um, by these attacks, of course, and I think we might very easily speak of it in terms of our own fears for such attacks on ourselves, on elders in our community, those kind of things. Um, I think it's worth remembering that the people who are making those attacks are more afraid than we are. They're afraid of losing something. And I think it's, uh, in some ways, it's empowering to understand that it is their fear that is leading to this violence. You know, one of the things that I love about your work, Peter, is the way you invoke memory and humor. And just listening to you read that chapter, um, which I, I, I do teach in, in one of my classes and the students go bonkers for it. And we have a really good time with it, despite the difficulty of the history. But, um, you know, when we're thinking about memory, right, and that keeps coming back, what do you remember? What do you remember? And it's almost you know, an invocation to us, right? Collectively us as a nation is like, why have we forgotten, right? And and we, we talk about this in my classes and as we're in this moment, right? Where, you know, we're grappling with the myth of the model my, minority, right? But then we have Black Lives Matter and I've had this conversation with a number of my students and, and um, you know, one student has a wonderful uh, senior thesis on this very question. As a teacher, how have you addressed this? And I know that you talk a little bit about this in your wonderful interview with Karen Long um, at Anstilled Wolf and the Asterisk, which, by the way, shameless plug, everybody needs to listen to this. It's terrific. But you, you get into that just like, how do you deal with this pedagogically, but also, you know, bringing that history in as well as literature as a writer. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean... <sighs> You know, I've written a lot of uh, historical fiction, historical novels, and so there's always a kind of question, um, often raised actually by journalists, why would you write about the past when there's so much going on in the present? Um, but of course, I, I think even for a writer of historical fiction, the subconscious choice to write about certain moments in the past is probably driven by the fact that it echoes in some way or resonates with our sense of the present, but also in a more direct way and maybe there's that pedagogical space. I think it also um, helps us understand the present moment, I think in various ways as well. Um, you know, and it does feel as though, I mean, I'm, I'm Zooming with you from Britain at the moment, I'm in a town called Coventry, which is car country in Britain as well. It's one of the reasons why when I was a teenager here growing up, um, uh, the Vincent Chin case uh, resonated with me when I heard about it in Britain um, because I had friends whose families were in the car business who were out of work. It felt like this whole city was struggling in some of the same ways that Detroit was struggling, I think, at the time. Um, but I also live, um, you know, a 20 minute drive from Stratford upon Avon from Shakespeare country. And so I, I feel like I live in a space um, that's um, very aware of history, not always accurately, right? So nations make myths for themselves in various ways. Um, but I think there are moments in the US where we are sometimes forgetful of our history or we're very much engaged in making a myth. Um, you know, the slogan, make America great again is about a making of myth, I think in various ways as well. Um, it is fake news in a certain sense. We might want to think about it in those terms. So reminding ourselves of the past, excavating that past, that feels like a, a duty, an obligation maybe for the historical novelist, but also maybe for all of us to try and understand that. And of course, the Black Lives Matter movement speaks very clearly into those spaces, thinking into questions of systematic racism, thinking about the deep roots of these kind of questions as well. Um, you know, and I think that's also true for the history of Asian Americans in the US as well. And again, something that we are beginning to think into a little bit in this space. And, you know, even those references in that section I just read, to Chinese working on the transcontinental railroad, those Chinese immigrants being driven out again, when jobs became a little uh, short supply after the railroad had been finished. All those things suggest that a lot of these, these things come back around again after many, many years, often after the point at which the cultural memory has forgotten some of those things along the way as well. So it feels like there's a, there's a reckoning to think about there. It's not that the British have fully grappled with that reckoning either, but it feels like it's a duty of citizens to think into that space. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. So one thing, Peter, that I, you know, I really appreciate about your book is that there's a reading discussion guide at the back. And one of the questions really struck me. And I thought to myself, I'd love to hear his answer to, to one of these questions. Um, usually they're for the folks who are in the book clubs or even in, in classes using your book. So I want to read it to you and, and, and get your thoughts. Um, and it's question five in the reading group guide. And it says on page 193, the narrator explains the thing about racism, I always think the worst thing, okay, is not that someone has made up their mind about you without knowing you, based on the color of your skin, the way you look, some preconception. The worst thing is that they might be right. Stereotypes cling if they have a little truth, they sting by the same token. Throughout the entire book, the author plays with stereotypes, pushing into them, subverting them, and calling attention to them. What effect does this produce? What is the author exposing about the nature and harm of stereotypes? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Great question. By, it's always interesting <laughs> to, to ask the author the question that's there in the study guide. Um, I, I'm reminded that this is a, a, a weird segue, but um, my son, who's um, uh, 16 now, was just taking, oh, well, I probably shouldn't say the name of it, uh, but a, a famous national standardized test. And he opened the first page of the test and there was a reading comprehension section and it was a reading comprehension section from my novel, The Fortunes. So it, 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 the, the text on, on the test was something that he, um, uh, it was close to home for him. Uh, but I've yet to see his answers to that. And I'm not even sure he'd get them right. And I'm not sure I would answer the questions correctly either in the context of the test. Uh, let me take a stab at it. I think that passage that you're referring to um, it does speak to something that I that I, I have felt at times very powerfully and that I think is sometimes referred to as um, uh, stereotype anxiety, right? This feeling that um, we, we struggle with aware that people are expecting us to conform to a certain stereotype. We resist conforming to that and yet we exp and nonetheless expect to be seen through that lens. It feels like it limits us, I think, in certain ways. We walk into a room and somebody's already, um, well, they're judging the book by the cover, right? I think essentially they're bringing to all that baggage they have to bear on that space. And that feels like a, a narrowing, a limiting of our humanity and our individuality. And I resist it, I think, in various ways. Um, and so I, I think the book is always about pushing back on stereotype. Um, and it maybe also speaks to the ways in which we internalize some of that stereotype, right? So some of us, I think that passage is this, you know, some of us are good at ping pong. Some of us like to take photographs. Some of us, you know, do conform to some of those things. And yet we feel guilty if we conform for those things as well. It's all about, I think, suggesting that those parts are not the whole of the individual. Um, the example I think I, I use um, in that passage that, that, uh, that, that I think as that passage continues, is to point out to certain readers uh, the white stereotype, which I think is becoming all the more apparent and true these days, which is that white people are racist. And I think if white people think into that space, and I think some of them are now internalizing that and begin to grapple with some of those spaces of guilt, it maybe sheds light on the stickiness of stereotype, right? The way it niggles at us or nags at us, I think, in certain ways. Um, because of course, you know, it's not that all white people are racist, but some of them are, right? That's the way that the generalization from one to many is really problematic or from few to many is really problematic. So it feels like an effort to explain stereotype to those who may not be as prone to stereotype anxiety as many of the rest of us are, I think, in some ways. It, this reminds me a little bit of something, Lisa, you were asking as well about memory. I think it's often been true within the Asian American community. There's even a, a fine documentary called Who Was Vincent Chin that sort of addresses this question of have we forgotten the case, right? And I think of that documentary, they're interviewing people of the next generation to see if they know the name, if they know the case. And some of them do and some of them don't, right? Um, so occasionally people ask me if I wrote about um, Vincent's story in order to remind Asian Americans of that history. Um, and to be honest, my own experience, and maybe this is because I live and work in Ann Arbor, and there are people who you know, knew Vincent, worked on the case, teaching the case to our undergraduates. I'm not worried in that context of people forgetting uh, the nature of the case. Um, if I wrote the story to remind anybody, it was I wrote the story to remind white readers of this history and of this experience. And that feels like the space um, that we need to reckon with. And, and that community feels like it needs to think into those spaces as well. Thank you. One of the questions I always have, because I'm a musician, is um, 
what I love about the fortunes is that you wrap it around music. And um, I threatened I was going to ask this question. I can't resist it. But and I, and I found that when I when I actually teach, you know, pieces of this book and also even when I read your other work, there's a real musical substrate and not just like clearly you know, Mr. Davies was listening to this at the time, but the way you also use music and satire within that, like Tell It Slant, right? It's an Emily Dickinson, but there was also the band The Slants, right? And, you know, so I found that when we listen to the music and we sort of listen to the, you know, both reclamation and also just outright, you know, racist stereotypes in the music, you know, you reference that so beautifully. And is that... How, how do you go about doing that? Is it just kind of present in the background? Because, I mean, obviously, Kung Fu Fighting, for example, was on the radio in the 80s, and it's an appalling song. Um, and, you know, the video alone is just, like, worth the price of admission. So mm-hmm. how do, is that sort of part of it? I mean, do you mind speaking a little bit well, about you know, it? It's, it's, it's a really complicated, um, you know, we're thinking about popular culture, right, and how even um, in apparently seemingly relatively familiar and even innocent elements of popular culture, kung fu fighting in some ways, at least at the surface, is just a kind of silly song, I think, in certain ways, right? Um, But nonetheless, those things nonetheless carry weight somehow, right? So, um, you know, uh, I was mentioning my son uh, before, he was young enough, I think, when Kung Fu Panda was coming out, and that song is reprised in that movie, inevitably. Um, but the lyrics were changed, and they were made to be a little less, uh, you know, uh, offensive. I think the phrase uh, Chinaman, which I use um, in the story in the context of that racist joke that I was reading, uh, referring to at the start of that piece that I read, is no longer in the song, which is something, right? Um, but I, I wanted us to think about the ways in which some racist tropes are almost invisible in the culture. They just become part of the wallpaper. So that's one of the ways of excavating the song space, I think, um, uh, in certain ways. But also how that also, I think, again, if we're Asian American, we're growing up in this country, we're listening to, the, we're listening to those songs as well, right? That's part of our cultural background. Um, and sometimes we need to be reminded of um, the landmines in some of that language along the way as well. So um, that was part of the the goal to think into that space. And I think you're right to say that I am really interested in the idea of reclamation. So the title of that um, that section, Tell It Slant, is a reference to the Emily Dickinson. And there's, I'm interested in that combination of um, fiction and non-fiction, the retelling of a uh, of a true story, but through a lens of fiction, through a particular perspective. It's very much a fictionalized perspective um, in the course of the novel. Um, but I was also very aware of the pejorative term of slants, uh, you know, as a, as a racist um, pejorative. And emboldened by that band you mentioned, the slants, I actually recently got to hear play in Ann Arbor, well, maybe a couple of years ago now, um, and their reclamation of that language, right? Um, we are familiar with the notion of the reclamation of epithets. Um, when we think about the N-word, I don't use, use it because it's not an epithet used against me, but I understand why um, Black communities would try and take that word and take it back and take the power away from those would use it against them. And we're, I think, very familiar with lots of tropes like that that have passed down to us through the years. Uh, The word suffragette was used as an epithet against those women at the start of the movement. Um, uh, The language of of calling painters impressionist was language used against them, but also taken on board as a badge of honor. We can think of similar language, I think, uh, 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 you know, that's been reclaimed by the gay community. Queer, I think, would fall into that category as well. Even in Michigan, um, uh, the, 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 the idea that we are Wolverines was originally an insult used by Ohioans against us. So we have this sense of reclaiming language. And so the, the idea of reclaiming the word slant as the band do, um, felt it felt a little punk to me, actually. I liked it. It felt empowering. It reminded me there's a, an all-female um, punk band called The Slits. And again, that reaclam- re- reclamation of language, it seems really powerful. And so there's a way that... Um, language, words can empower us and also take that power back from those who would use language against us. It felt a little bit in that space. And those jokes too feel like they're being reclaimed in that context as well, I hope. Um, uh, And then lastly, Lisa, just to go back to the music, I think the one, there are references to music, you know, um, Anna Mae Wong and some of the songs written about her feature in the book as well. The, the, one of the epigraphs to the book is that oriental riff that you hear at the start of Kung Fu Panda and David Bowie's China Girl and all kinds, you know, it's a it's a musical stereotype essentially, right? That's what I was thinking into in that space. Um, I think the one song that I didn't quite get to work in, although it's one that I quite like, is um, Paul Simon's Mother and Child Reunion. 
which I think is named after a dish in a Chinese restaurant, a chicken and egg dish called Mother and Child Reunion, which I think inspired the song. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do with that exactly, but I do quite like the song and it would have been nice to, to weave it in there somewhere. That felt like a, uh, maybe I learned a, a, a bit too late to weave it into the book, but um, that's a slightly happier, I think, instance rather than some of these others that we've been talking about. Thank you. I'm adding that to the playlist next to my teacher chapter. <laughs> so, Peter, thank you. This has been such a, a wonderful talk. And I, I always like to end um, with folks on, on a question about um, what would be some other resources, books, articles, films, songs that you think would be appropriate for folks to be thinking about during our um, APITA Heritage Month and to even continue to learn more about history, to learn more about current pop culture um, that would really help uh, folks to dive deep into the PETA culture and heritage here in the United States? Yeah, no, that's a great question. In fact, um, it's funny, I was thinking into a couple of things recently. Um, one is, I, I'm going to, so I was having this conversation uh, about the book with um, high schoolers in Chicago via Zoom recently. I, I'd visited the same school um, a couple of years ago in person, and I Zoomed in with them again. They, they taught the fortunes to their high schools, so there's portions of it. And um, one of those high schoolers um, who I chatted to a little bit at the, at the end of the Zoom is a young woman called uh, Emily Liu. And she published, a, I thought, a really interesting op-ed in the Chicago Tribune a couple of years ago. It's entitled, I'm a multicultural teen trying to fit into our melting pot. Um, and, you know, I, as we were joking about earlier, I'm kind of an old fart now. And I'm here visiting with my mother and her generational experience of some of these things and my generational experience of some of these things. Um, are different. We've, I think, in, I, I learned from my mother to embrace some of these challenges with humor to diffuse um, the power of the other over me, I think, in some ways. Um, but one of the things Emily talks about in that op-ed is hearing somebody make a joke, uh, you know, she was talking about learning to drive and somebody made some off-color joke in the school cafeteria about how can you see through those, you know, slit eyes, you know, something just, you know, very unpleasant. And she called that person out. And I thought, you know, that gives me hope for the younger generation. So that might be something for people to look up along the way. And then I was going to just plug, um, you know, there are all kinds of great writers out there. Some of them are friends of mine like Chang Wei Li and Madeline Tien. Um, uh, you know, one of my recent MFA students, Lillian Lee, has a wonderful book called The Number One Chinese Restaurant. But I was actually going to put on people's radar uh, two or three books that are just coming out this summer by um, Asian American writers. Um, one is... Um, really interesting book, a lot about identity, but with some really interesting um, uh, genre crossing qualities as well by a Korean American writer called Angela Mi Yong Hur. It's called Folklore, which I'd recommend strongly. Um, another former student is a, uh, a woman called Linda Rui Feng, who's swimming back to Trout River, is a, a book in part about the Cultural Revolution. Um, and I think it's a really interesting uh, text in that regard as well. Um, and I have a uh, a former student, uh, Muslim, Muslim American called Nawaz Ahmad, who has a book called um, Radiant Fugitives that is coming out, um, I think again this summer. And I think all the three of those books um, that I've been lucky enough to see uh, in progress and to see um, uh, just before they came out as well, um, a wonderful text. So people are looking for, um, you know, not the usual suspects, although there are many great people in those regards as well. Those might be interesting texts to look for as well. Thank you so much. And, and I think Claire has one last question and sure, we'll close it out. So first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your reading. I absolutely loved hearing you read it. Um, my question was more so, I thought two things that you said today really struck a chord with me. The first being when you spoke about um, Ishiguro being lauded as like a great British writer and feeling like, wow, someone who looks like me can be considered British. But at the same time in Tell It Slant, the narrator talks about how Bruce Lee was actually, he felt much more Chinese than Chinese American. And I guess that kind of really echoed this kind of disillusionment I feel with being Korean American sometimes where it's like, I feel an immense sense of privilege to be American and be able to take part in these discourses and educate people about the Korean American experience and things like this. But at the same time, it can be very exhausting, very hard. I'm constantly aware of like, 
the stereotypes and just how people see me, no matter how much I'm happy, proud of my identity or things like that. And sometimes like, especially growing up in Asia, it's like, mm, do I stay in America? Where I'll inevitably like, I might hit this glass ceiling because of what I look like, or do I go back to Asia with the experience that has, experiences that I've had? And it's just like a very big struggle, especially in this world where you talk about everything is changing, Western hegemony is like slowly, um, everything's transforming and we're in this huge time of change. So I wanted to ask if you could just, if you had any advice, I guess, for just young um, Asian Americans or like people that are living in two cultures, things like that, because especially like you're Welsh as well, you grew up in the UK. So that was just my thoughts. No, it, it, that's a great question, Claire. Um, and I feel it. I, I'm not sure that makes me uh, fully able to answer it. Um, what you're describing, I think, um, is an interesting choice. We um, we often, those of us who feel like we have a kind of hyphenated identity, feel like there's a choice, like a, a, a choice of allegiance, um, a choice of culture, to choose to be more assimilated feels like a betrayal of a certain kind of heritage. To stand with that heritage feels like it's a failure to join into the culture that we most live in, I think, in various ways. Um, and, you know, I, I think in the writing of the fortunes, one of the things that was helpful to me, uh, one of the values of writing the book for me was um, that I began to reconcile that, not to feel that it was an either or, but that it was a both, um, that it didn't I didn't have to fall on one side or the other of the hyphen, that my existence was the hyphen in a strange way, right? Um, an embrace of that thing, of rather than feeling not quite enough of one thing or the other, that this, this hyphenated identity was a third thing. But what you're describing is almost a... Um, that choice being played out in geographical terms, to stay here, uh, to move to a working space in Asia. We were talking earlier on about your family, uh, you know, being based in Singapore. Um, but Singapore is a fascinating location, right? One of the things that's so interesting about that space is that it feels, <sighs> we could talk a lot about Singapore, um, but it feels as though it too is, uh, is on that hyphen, right? It feels like a very Asian city. It also feels in many ways like a very Western city. It feels like it's a, a reconciliation of both of those things. Um, so I wonder if that's a space particularly where it would be not quite a choice, right? That it's a geographical location that straddles that hyphen in some ways as well. I, I'm not sure if that's an answer. Um, but it feels like a fascinating question and a fascinating experience to live through as well as you experience that. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was excellent. My pleasure. Thank you for the great questions, everybody, and really for the invitation, the beautiful introduction as well, Clara, really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen. And thank you, Claire, uh, for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors. And we hope that um, those of you who are able to watch this are also uh, very much uh, appreciating what we've been able to experience over this hour. So we appreciate all of your support in attending. And um, thank you again, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, family. Thanks, everybody, for your attention as well. I really appreciate it.